I declare that the 505th Convocation of McMaster University for the conferring of degrees is now in session. Please be seated. <clears throat> Good morning. My name is Dr. Peter Smith, Acting Provost and Vice President Academic of the University. This morning, I have the great pleasure of acting as your Master of Ceremonies and of, and of welcoming you all to Convocation. Before we start our formal program, may I first ask everyone in the hall to switch off any electronic devices that may ring or beep during the ceremony. I would like to now call upon our Chancellor, Dr. Linton Wilson, to make his own welcoming remarks. A very good morning to you all. President and Vice Chancellor, Chairman of our Board of Governors, Provost, Dean Yates, our honorary graduate, members of the platform party, graduands, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to this 505th convocation of McMaster University. To our graduates, congratulations on your successes, on reaching an important milestone, an exciting milestone in your lives. Many of you will begin careers embarking on new journeys. Some of you will be continuing your education, training, or preparation for more advanced or specialized activities. The very best of luck to each and every one of you. To the parents, grandparents, family members, spouses, and friends here today, I invite you to take a bow as well. You can be proud of the roles you've played and the accomplishments being recognized in this convocation. To our faculty and staff, today marks tangible recognition of your efforts, particularly the successes of your students evident in this ceremony. Thank you and congratulations. This is a day of celebration. I wish you all an enjoyable morning. Thank you. I would like now to introduce Dr. Patrick Dean, <coughs> President and Vice Chancellor, who will be presenting our honorary degree recipient. Mr. Chancellor, by the authority of the Senate of McMaster University, I have the honor to present Raymond Curry. <clears throat> Dr. Raymond Curry is an iconic figure in Canadian social sciences and a man whose career began on a path that may seem worlds removed from his influential research in sociology, but on closer examination, there is a clear thread connecting the entirety of his professional life, and that is his abiding interest and faith in the welfare of his communities. Dr. Curry is an ordained priest who conducted ministry across Western Canada until 1976, before undertaking postgraduate studies at Fordham University. 
1972, he joined the University of Manitoba as an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology, becoming a full professor in 1989. He served as head of the department and then as dean of the Faculty of Arts from 1991 to 1999. He has been dean emeritus since his retirement from the university in 2000. He later served as the executive director of the Canadian Research Data Center Network for eight years. Dr. Curry's research focuses on urban sociology, sociology of religion, alcohol use, community attitudes towards neighborhood mental health facilities, single mothers, and quality of education. He is the co-author of Fragile Truths, 25 Years of Sociology and Anthropology in Canada, and of research at, research at Royal Commissions, Guidelines and Procedures. The landmark of his scholarly research is his founding in 1980 of the Winnipeg Area Study, an annual survey of 750 households. The findings are part of the Inter-University Consortium for Political Science and Social Research, and more than 60 scholars have used that data in their research. Dr. Curry is a past member of the editorial board of Social Indicators Research, and in 2008, he published the autobiography, Secure and Uncertain, A Father's Story. A former member of the Board of Management for the Data Liberation Initiative and the National Committee of the Humanities and Social Sciences Federation of Canada, Dr. Curry has been on the Board of Directors of the Social Sciences Federation of Canada and also served on the National Executive of the Canadian Sociology and Anthropology Association. In his local community, he chaired the board of Villa Rosa, a home for single mothers, and served as president of the board of the Prairie Action Foundation that raised millions of dollars in support of a research network that connects the universities of Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Calgary as they investigate solutions to violence and abuse. Dr. Curry is an honorary board member of Manitoba Special Olympics. Dr. Curry's awards include the University of Manitoba's Peter D. Curry Chancellor's Award, the Canadian Association of University Business Officers Innovation in Management Award, the Canadian Sociology and Anthropology Association Outstanding Contribution Award, the Faculty Association Administrator of the Year Award, and the University of Manitoba Community Service Award. The Statistical Society of Canada honored him with the Lees Manchester Award in 2010. Mr. Chancellor, it is an honor to present to you Dr. Raymond Curry, a social scientist, an institutional leader, an author, a dedicated community volunteer, and a trailblazer in Canadian sociological research. I ask that you confer upon Dr. Curry the degree Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa. You may want to remove your hat. She's going to put the hood on. Okay. Raymond Curry, by the authority of McMaster University Senate, I have the great pleasure to confer upon you the degree Doctor of Laws honoris causa in McMaster University with all the rights and privileges pertaining to that degree. Congratulations to you. Thank you very much. Please come and sign the book. It's now my pleasure and privilege to call upon Dr. Curry to deliver the convocation address. Dr. Curry. Uh, 
uh, Mr. Chancellor uh, Linton Wilson, President and Vice Chancellor Patrick Dean, members of the board, colleagues, graduating students, and friends. It's really impossible to put into words the honor I feel standing here today as a recipient of an honorary degree from McMaster University. It's not false humility to say that it was totally unexpected. But given this opportunity, I would like to share, especially with the graduating students, some aspects of my professional life that have given me the most satisfaction. <clears throat> From 1986 to 1990, I served as the program chair for the Canadian Sociology and Anthropology National Meetings. In 1990, we celebrated the 25th year of our association, and our committee co-edited a book incorporating the best papers. We called it Fragile Truths, 25 Years of Sociology and Anthropology in Canada. I've always loved that title, Fragile Truths. I appreciated it even more recently when I read that John Polanyi, the Canadian Nobel Prize winner in chemistry, wrote that all science uh, needs a democracy to thrive. We don't go to meetings to announce the truth, he said. We go to present our ideas and discoveries to peers and engage in debate about their truth. What an important insight. All of us at universities, including our students, of course, are seekers of truth. And our democracy is its context. Our truths, like our democracy, are sometimes fragile. In that same year, circa 1990, circumstances forced me to reflect again on how I could best contribute to this ongoing search for truth. Colleagues at the University of Manitoba encouraged me to let my name stand as a candidate for Dean of Arts of the Faculty. I remember a conversation I had with my wife, Charlene, who I must say has been an extraordinary support to me all of my life, all of our, certainly all of our married life. I, we talked about this. I have been reasonably successful in my teaching and research and publications, and I could continue to do that with great satisfaction. However, my, in my whole life, I seem to be thrust into leadership roles, and I love the challenge of developing a vision. However, I feel I'm happiest when I bring a spirit of service in the pursuit of that vision. And that was my motive for assuming an administrative role. We may have different visions and goals, different truths that we all pursue. But no matter what our vision is, we can all bring a sense of service in the pursuit of those visions. I encourage all of you who are graduating to reflect on this. Service is not oppression. It's not slavery, it's not drudgery. Service in its own way is power. It's a form of charisma. It inspires. It treats all people with respect. It recognizes their successes. It listens attentively, is open in leadership, in decision-making, and always works for the common good. Giving of oneself in that spirit of service can reap some of the most satisfying moments in life. It is giving of ourselves in our family, to our partner, our spouse, certainly to our children, and perhaps to our parents and, their, and our siblings in their later years, as well as giving of ourselves in our work, in our community, and in the world. And when your financial situation permits after that dreaded student uh, load eases, you can perhaps give to support charities and uh, other social issues that can make such a difference in the lives of others. In my experience, it is much easier to give than to receive. 
it's also much more rewarding. Don't worry about recognition. Do it because it's the right thing to do. It will be life-giving for others, but also for you. You've had the privilege of learning at a university, a great university. Obviously, it's not the only place you've learned. Perhaps you've learned more at the feet of your parents or a relative, a coach, only you know. But I hope you can look back at your years at McMaster and be grateful for all that you have received. With a degree, I ask you to consider the greater impact you will be able to have on the lives of others. You've learned far more than a particular discipline. Find a way to use your knowledge, your energy, your wisdom, and all your talents to make the lives in your community and in the world richer and better for your presence. In a democracy, we need each other. In our search for truth, we need each other. In conclusion, let me refer to a quote from Nelson Mandela that is on the McMaster website of your Dean of Social Sciences, uh, Charlotte Yates. Education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Education is seeking the truth. May you always use your education, your search for truth in the service of others. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Curry, for those wise and thoughtful words. Your life and your work, your writings, have been an inspiration to all of us. And we're absolutely delighted to count you now as an alumnus of our university. Thank you very much. Dr. Patrick Dean will now come forward to present the graduands to our chancellor for admission to their degrees. Will the graduands please stand? Mr. Chancellor, on behalf of McMaster University Senate, I present to you these candidates in order that you may confer the appropriate degrees upon them, and I bear witness that they are worthy and suitable. Graduands, by my authority and that of the McMaster University Senate, I have the great pleasure to admit you to your individual degrees in McMaster University with all of the rights and privileges pertaining to those degrees. My sincere congratulations to you all. Please be seated. Mr. Chancellor, on behalf of McMaster University Senate, may I also request that you confer the appropriate degrees in absentia upon all those candidates who have successfully completed the required course of study but who are not present. I declare all these degrees conferred in absentia. Graduates, I now ask each of you to join me on the stage so that the Chancellor and I may welcome you into the McMaster community of scholars.
Ladies and gentlemen, it would be appreciated if during the presentation of the graduands you would hold your applause until the end of each degree category. Thank you. Mr. Chancellor, may I present to you the following graduate of the degree Master of Social Work. Maria Mercedes Sapicho Moro. Mr. Chancellor, may I present to you <clears throat> the following graduates of the degree Bachelor of Arts Honors. Ryan Abriel. Julia Christine Agro. <clears throat> Olamide Akinwumi. Ida Lizette Aldea. Amanda Amore. Courtney Anderson. Mayan Anderson. <clears throat> Nicole Julia Andruskovich. Dylan J. Babeth Toth. Kyla Antonietta Baird. Lauren Victoria Baker. Nicolina Barisic. Ashley Maria Mar Burrito. <clears throat> Milena Basara. Jillian Teresa Beaton. Tanya Robin Bashard. Sherry Lynn Beckerson. Melissa Ellen Bennett. Yulia Berezovska. Jocelyn Bayer. Karu Nicole Bitten. Ryan Blake. Sarah Jesse Blakely McClure. Kevin Michael Boyle. Leanne Patricia Bradbury. Alicia Bridge. Ashley Jean Bukar. Carla Burgi. K. 
Kendra Campbell. Michael Emmanuel de Cruz Caterino. Louisa Chan. Melanie Chang. Jennifer Jean Melissa Chow. Melanie May Lynn Cochran. Joseph Camiso. Kyle Alexander Croft. Lisa Diane Sabanyak. Megan Nicole D'Angelo. Gail Ann DaCosta. Malika Dabirian. Aisha Dag Ellums. Anna Dankovich. Georgia Terlin Davis. Hannah Grace Demick. Tanya Demkovitz. Brittany Burns Dennis. Emily DeVries. Kyle Delane. Patrick Donald. Ian Michael Duran Sudovicius. Catherine Dunn. Michael Scott Dwinell. Andra Liga Zintaz. Kristen Marita Eccles. Christine Fandrich. Courtney Lee Fernside. Xenia Judith Ferreira. Giuseppina Filuzzi. Jessica Grace Fish. Catherine Forbeck. Brittany Fresco. Caitlin Allison Gammy. Stephanie Catherine Garatha.
Ardiana Gashi. Philip Genovese. Jamie Gibson. Jessica Gillard. Sarah Rose Glover. Anita Narosha Gregory. Giordano Guidi. Kelly Roslyn Hall. Megan Elizabeth Hamilton. Amanda Helena Harris. Melissa Marie Hillis. Catherine Holden. <clears throat> Megan Hudson. Jocelyn Meredith Hunt. Osalamezi Ekrarebe. Torian Allegra Epima. Ryan Jeffrey Jensen. Alicia Juani. Suzanne Elizabeth Kane. Victoria Karim. Tiana Marie Kennedy. Thank you. Natalie King. Tierney Kovalgenic. Jacqueline Cutt. Soyin Dorcas Kwan. Lucina Alexandra Kwiatkowska. Emily Lay. Jacqueline Hu Ying Lao. Mireille and Elizabeth Lamalin. Yu Li. Carmen Rocco Licio. Jamie Elizabeth List. Maggie Lee McDougall.
Kevin Paul Mackay. Calvin Eric McKenzie. Salome Madani. Catherine Isabella Makara. Yuri Malakov. Safa Malik. Marina Anna Mancini. Jamie Thivia Mariathas. Clark Edward Martin. Jessica Ann Martin. Valerie Harriet Masinzo. Jocelyn Marie Mative. Alexa Victoria Gina Maxwell. Leanne McIntosh. Michelle Merler. Yawi Mi. Sanjit Nona Nanunan. Rachel Mira Nelson. Rebecca Elizabeth Newman. Shelley Obermeyer. Yay! Ibukan Olobiye. Amanda Oreto. Samantha Leanne Orico. Bartos Orzel. Cassandra Oswald. Nina Pacheco. Victoria Lee Pacey. Anastasia Papachava. Monica Juliet Persky. Jennifer Jean Pettis. Daniel Peroni. Christina Poldre. Chantelle Pont.
Stephen Mario Presta. Izam Ahmed Kazi. <laughs> Sarah Randall. Nirali Ravi. Natasha Rabello. Catherine Elizabeth Ritzy. Caitlin Rocky. Ashley Roach. Erin Alexandra Rose. Kelly Ross. Janelle Katrine Royer. Caitlin Alexandria Rush. Caitlin Diana Joy Ruti. Leah Riasi. Sarah Joy Saliz. Jessica Rose Sandquist. Raina Maya Sansanwal. Jason Deep Sarah. Brittany Saunders. Braden George Schnarr. Kyla Schneider. Laura Margaret Scott. Eleanor Sarah Seymour. Anne Mary Simpson. Stephanie Smith. Roxana Sabota. Aaron Jane Stanis Morales. Michelle Ann Stephenson. Michael Stoikic. Kristen Ashley Taylor. Esther Toth. Omar Trail. Ebony Trenton.
Lindsay Jane Turner. Deanna Louise Vincent. Zachary Walker. Catherine Jenny Wood. Candace Marie Warsfold. Lauren Michelle Wright. Melissa Victoria Kelly Zacharak. Mr. Chancellor, may I present to you the following graduates of the degree Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Social Work. Zara Abdul Hussein. Charnel Roslyn Bernard. Katie Ann Walsh Brims. Giovanni Carranza Hernandez. Emma Marie Chappelle. James Anthony Curtis Welsh. Jessica Rosemary Dakins. Miranda Duru. Marisa Dodgson. Victoria Ann Fritz. Matthew Peter Gowing. Caitlin Marie Mary Hallis. Lauren Jane Hurst. Christina Eleanor Highland. Victoria Jamoko. Amelie Matt. Joanne Lynn Montgomery Murphy. Natalie Outridge. Sheldon Reed. Carrie Ann Salt. <laughs> Melissa Jane Schoon. <laughs> Nat
Nikki Shannon. Jessica Sharrow. Yeah. Della Mary Peach Smith. Janelle Stupka Simons. Devita Suknandan. Chanel White. Morgan Rebecca Zavarella. Mr. Chancellor, may I present to you the following graduates of the degree Bachelor of Social Work. Thomas Stephen Michael Ambrosiatis. Sarah Lynn Anderson. Jackie Browning. Shannon Dindial. Samantha Gail Giorgio. <laughs> Kayla Marie, Marie Gilchrist. James Douglas Green. Lorraine Ann Holt. Jessica Ann Kay. Carolyn Kathy Cognac. Lindsay Catherine Louch. Maureen Prince Kulos. Lucy Rivet. Alicia Marie Teasdale. Alicia! Donna Jane Tyler. Mr. Chancellor, may I present to you the following graduates of the degree Bachelor of Arts. Sheikh Omar Ahmed. Chelsea Alexander. Jessica Alves. Sierra Ancio. Karina Portela Antunes.
Fonville Atiagaga. Heather Elizabeth Atkinson. Alison Lee Baker. Shermia Rona Balthazar. Andrew Bartolotta. Catherine Francis Batt. Lauren Elizabeth Bell. Michele Franco Bellinghieri. Jill Louise Beverly. Saima Bati. Ilana Mea Blumenkranz. Casey Bombardieri. Christine S. Bonamici. Shelley Burke. Jacob Murray Campbell. Victoria Ryan Karuk. Taylor Noel Sherott. Priscilla Lorraine Chung. Leah Clark. Jeremy Rose Cruz. Chantelle Culver. Naema Iagume Dag Elams. Nicole Shelley Deeb. Kevin DeMille. Adam DeFries. Melissa Ashley DeSalvo. Jamie Dixon. Laura Dockray. Kevin Thomas Dowling. Grant Fairchild. Charles Andrew Fernley. Melissa Jane Flynn. Alyssa Fotheringham. Adiani Gashi. Ryan Gautier. <laughs> 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 
Gregory Garum. Andrea Jamos. Alisa Joya. Cassandra Giorgio. Fanny, Fanny Elieth Gutierrez Ruiz. Dylan Joseph Hache. Martin Thor Hammond. Victoria Hay. Kristen Henri Mathieu. Chantel Ironside. Alexander Isotti Pongetti. Jane Plangnan Jackton. Adam Jankowski. Mechvish Jelani. Ian James Johnston. Biaula Perpetual Joseph. Gregory Arthur Kalmatz. Jasmine Katkar. Jordan Michael Kinsman. Helena Kiriapolis. Carol Koo. Michael Lamb. Vivian Lamb. <laughs> Stacy Lau. Nicole Loarts. Danielle Alexander McIntyre. Miranda McClellan. Giuseppe Mamone. Este Mancini. John Louis Mara. Ryan Maynard. Alisa Onika McCook. Catherine McDonald. Megan Patricia McLaughlin. Andrew Douglas McQueen.
Anjali Mehta. Danielle Elizabeth Miller. Drew James Morris. Lynn Agnes Murray. Julia, Julia Arlene Nawagabo. Jessica Nan. Usaoko Ngonadi. <laughs> Melissa Augustino Nunes. <laughs> Nikki Palioras. <laughs> Alicia Ruth Pampano. Jacqueline Para Gomez. Adria Noreen Paxton. Jason Anthony Pereira. Alicia Pesadi. Rachel Lynn Picacci. Achana Pillai. Eva Pokletchki. Patrick John Pokoski. Philip Robert Prey. Brendan Prince. Maria Claudia Quijano. Terry Annette Ramirez. Adam Louis Reich. Rebecca Alicia Ravy. Mallory Richardson. Kaisi Lay. Solidum Rosdal. Joyce Suzanne Sage. Sayina Sher Rula. Sarah Marie Sherman. Sohel Shivji. Jessica Smoke. Daniel Paul Stevens. Melissa Stewart. Hala Suleiman.
Festa Tahiri. Christine Fong Zing Tam. Paula M. Paolo M. Tarasak Saski. Nathan David Van der Gulik. Mike Van der Felder. Kyle William Vash. Stephanie Grace Waldron. Rebecca Jean Walton. Bailey Marie Webster. Samantha Susan Viedrich. Heather Williams. Zi Yong Yong Wu. Katerina Alexandra Zingul. Ladies and gentlemen, I would now like to introduce you to Ms. Lee van der Gast, a graduate of the Bachelor of Arts Honours Program, who will be delivering the valedictory address. Good morning. Thank you, Chancellor Wilson, President Dean, Dean Yates, family and friends, and above all, my fellow graduates. Today is a day that we have looked forward to with great anticipation for many years. This is a day of celebration defined by one common ending and numerous new beginnings. Today we recognize the end of an incredible journey of endurance and dedication. Standing on the brink of what is often referred to as real life, we look out into our futures yet realize all that we have accomplished. Not only have we attended McMaster, a world-class institution but we have flourished here. Immersed in this academic arcade, we have become a part of a community that has fostered the identity of each and every one of us. Our accomplishments, however, have not been the product of our solitary endeavors. We are so fortunate and thankful for the guidance and support provided by the people who sit here behind us today and have stood behind us for the past four years. To our families and friends, who encouraged, listened, proofread, and prodded us on, carrying our mattresses and mini fridges up and down the stairs every year, we would not be here today without you. Along the way, we have encountered many professors who have inspired us beyond imagination, stimulating an inquiry and encouraging us to question all that we think we know. We may have found it difficult at times to truly understand the interworkings of their encyclopedic brains, as somehow, Faster than you could say Google, they always seem to have the answer, truly teaching us every step of the way. The learning, however, did not stop within the classroom, as most of the most valuable lessons learned here came from each other, our friends and our peers. For one, we have grown from timid first years who quickly learned that the day before Friday would no longer be known as Thursday, but quarters to seasoned seniors who know that the highlight of any Welcome Week PJ Parade is definitely not the PJs. Looking back on the past four years, I have come to realize that McMaster is not simply a place. It is a true community in every sense of the word. This community and the relationships that have come to define my McMaster have had a tremendous and enduring impact on me, 
allowing me to realize that the journey itself is just as valuable as the end destination. I have special reason for valuing such sense of community. As a first year resident of Brandon Hall, I was a part of the group who was forced to abandon the residence when a fire broke out in the fall of 2008. The Brandon Hall family that had emerged during the first six weeks of school was seriously fragmented. That unfortunate reality, however, drastically altered the way in which I perceived and valued the entire McMaster community. As for those of us who returned to residence, worked to rebuild that sense of camaraderie, recreating a Brandon family with an entirely new face and form. Another event that will forever be unique to my time at McMaster was the opportunity to, opportunity to study abroad at the University of Copenhagen, Denmark. An experience that truly opened my eyes and allowed me to find my own path in life through exploring different cultures, understanding new peoples and traditions, and extending my palette to what else is really out there. Thrust into new and challenging situations, you discover things about yourself that once never imagined possible. When I returned home, however, I was quickly reminded of McMaster's global presence as a place where cultural and political difference is embraced, spirituality is practiced, and the issues of our time are confronted and debated. We have had the privilege of spending our most formative, intellectually curious, challenging, yet extremely exciting years of our lives here. Swimming, or what some might refer to as a frantic doggy paddle, through an endless sea of essays, journal articles, papers, exams, take-home exams, and more essays, we were challenged daily, solving questions not only regarding what things are, but how and why. No matter how distant the past four years become, the capacity for critical thought and hard work that we have developed here will undoubtedly stay with us forever. The ancient Greek philosopher Plutarch once said that what we achieve inwardly will change our outer reality. We live in a time of difficult and uncertain realities, yet our academic conquests and achievements within the social sciences have provided us with the foundation needed to not only imagine ourselves into something better, but the ability to attain it. Our intellect, determination, and compassion allows us to see every setback as a challenge and every challenge with the confidence to succeed in making the intangible a reality. Our training in the social sciences has also taught us about the value of human and social capital. Be it the numerous, numerous recent social revolutions on a global scale or as thousands of MAC students came in support of our men's varsity football team in the final moments of the Vanier Cup. We have witnessed the power of collective action. Our humanity is shaped by our empathy and compassion for one another and our ability to build relationships, remembering that when we work together, we can achieve the impossible. With our social sciences degrees in hand and in our heart and mind, we take great pride moving forward, knowing that in this increasingly complex world, our degrees provide us with both the desire and capacity to truly make a difference. I believe that life is defined by opportunity, and experience, and that every relationship made at MAC has the ability to lead to new experiences and life-changing paths. So as we move on from our McMaster home, I know that we will continue to grow and become stronger with every challenge and new encounter. No matter how distant the past four years become, our experiences at MAC will stay with us forever, sustaining and nourishing us as we take the skills and knowledge we have gained here out into the real world leaving evidence of our passions in everything we do. Congratulations to the Social Sciences graduating class of 2012. Thank, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Charlotte Yates, the Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences, and I would like to draw your attention to the awards of session won by the students of the Faculty of Social Sciences. They're listed on pages 11 and 12 of your program. Thank you and congratulations, students. May I introduce to you Mr. Ian Cowan, a representative of the McMaster Alumni Association, who will now deliver the Alumni Association address.
Chancellor Wilson, <clears throat> President Dean, McMaster faculty, fellow alumni, honored guests, and members of the McMaster class of 2012. I'm a proud McMaster graduate from 1971 and 1976, and a past president of the McMaster Alumni Association and a board member for several years. Currently, I'm a McMaster Alumni Association representative to the McMaster Senate and a member of the Senate Executive. And what you'll find out once you start to volunteer at McMaster, you never escape, or should I say, endless opportunities abound. Over the course of its 125-year history, our university has granted degrees at convocation ceremonies in Toronto, on the McMaster campus in Hamilton, and more recently, here at Hamilton Place. Our chancellors have shaken hands with graduates during Queen Victoria's reign, the Great Depression, the two world wars, and the internet age. McMaster students have become McMaster alumni in eras and circumstances that seem unconnected to those before and after. Fashions, attitudes, learning styles, tuition fees, <clears throat> excuse me, and cafeteria food, everything has changed. But regardless of era, those alumni all, we all, share a place in the McMaster family. We are connected from year to year, from decade to decade, from generation to generation, McMaster classes one and all. Each and every McMaster class is unique, but in truth, shares two things with all others. The first is the great potential you have as new graduates of one of the truly great universities in the world. The second is that we all share a history with McMaster, a familial connection and a responsibility to it and each other to build on the legacy we inherited and to continue McMaster's story of excellence. Playing a role in extending that legacy is easier than it sounds. The most important thing that you can do is contribute. Contribute to your professions, your avocations, your communities, and your families. Your achievements had a shine to my degree and to the degree, degrees of everyone wearing a graduation ground, gown today. Uh, to quote from a financial planning book, The Wealth or Bar Wealthy Barber Returns, the best things in life aren't things. The other thing you can do is stay engaged with your university. That's why the McMaster Alumni Association is here. In your hands, you have our convocation booklet that describes our programs and the opportunities you have to stay connected with your alma mater and with your fellow Mac grads. You can be part of Mac 10, a comp comprehensive new program designed to meet the professional, social, and intellectual needs of graduates of the last decade. Mac 10 offers events, career services, mentorships, online resources, and other ways to connect. Watch for the alumni magazine, McMaster Times, in your mailbox, or stay tuned for the launch, launch of our new online community this fall. Follow the association on email, Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube. Access value-added services like home, auto, and life insurance. Join your fellow alumni at one of the hundreds of, of events we organize annually in Hamilton, Hong Kong, Halifax, and many other places that don't start with the letter H. There is a place for all of you in the McMaster Alumni Association. Today, we celebrate your success as students and toast the promise of your bright futures as alumni. Your fellow Mac grads are proud of you, al are proud of you already. We offer you our most sincere congratulations and a warm welcome to the McMaster alumni family, a family 125 years in the making. Thank you. May I invite Dr. Dean back to the podium to deliver his president's address. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chancellor, Mr. Board Chair, Dr. Curry, esteemed colleagues, graduates, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor to be able to speak at this occasion. Uh, as you come to the end of a period of study, uh, there is a great deal to celebrate and, of course, a great deal of excitement in anticipation of where you will go beyond this point. And it's a wonderful opportunity to be able to say a few words to you about some of the challenges that I think 
uh, await you in the world outside of this, this building. I begin with a quote. Bliss was it in that dawn to be alive. Now, this was the title of an album released by the ambient trip-hop duo Arms and Sleepers in 2006, which is about the same time most of you were just beginning to contemplate which university you would choose, which program of study might suit you, and what career option might best satisfy your talents, your temperament, and your inclinations. Today, I would expect that at least some of you, uh, and certainly a good number of your parents and supporters, will be looking back at that time of choice and marveling at the distance you have traveled since then. And as you sat there, weighing up one university prospectus against the other, good sense against the pressure of your peers, fear of the unknown against the desire for adventure, I'm not sure you would have said that you were in a state of bliss. My recollections uh, from such discussions in my own family were very different, ending, as I recall, usually with someone slamming down a book and shouting at me, yes, Dad, but whose life is it anyway? But to be poised at the opening of a new phase in your life, to have at least choices about how that phase will be constituted, to be able to dream of your future without the fear that you may be proven naive for thinking that you have one, this is an experience of privilege. And despite all the superficial anguish that attends these kinds of occasions, I know you will today recall the pregnant quality, the powerful promise of that moment when you made your choice. Bliss was it in that dawn to be alive. Now, those of you who know their literature and whose tastes don't incline to ambient trip-hop music are probably by now very keen to point out to me that the actual source of that quotation is the English romantic poet William Wordsworth. In the 10th book of whose long poem, The Prelude, the poet remembers the excitement he felt in France when he arrived there in 1790, one year after the storming of the Bastille and the start of the French Revolution. The lines are very famous, and I'll read five of them to you. Oh, pleasant exercise of hope and joy, for great were the auxiliars which then stood upon our side, we who were strong in love. Bliss was it in that dawn to be alive, but to be young was very heaven. Now, I've chosen this as the text for my remarks today, certainly because you're on the whole young and gathered here today in a differently pleasant exercise of hope and joy, which is the ceremony of convocation. But there's a good deal more to the parallel than this. Wordsworth's lines evoke a very powerful, powerful sense of community. Our side, he says, is strong in love. And there's a sense of community confronting, in fact, even instigating a far-reaching and radical human transformation. What invigorates in the lines and in the speaker is the prospect of doing something great, but moreover doing it in partnership with others. There are these two sides of community, the agent through which you achieve great things and the goal which you seek to achieve. The goal, a new human dispensation, a society which is not just an agglomeration of faceless individuals, but an organism as Wordsworth puts it, strong in love. Now, it may be true that in every age, the young feel this need for a fundamental reconsideration and reconfiguration of the human order. But there are compelling reasons to regard this present age as an age of revolution every bit as critical as that which began with the American Revolution in the last quarter of the 18th century, included the French Revolution, and continued on for approximately 75 years. You may be familiar with the term quiet revolution. It has particular application to Canadian politics, particularly to the transformation of Quebec in the 1960s. But the term is obviously relevant to the kind of dramatic and far-reaching shift in economic and social relationships that is presently underway on the world stage. 
I was recently in Brazil as part of the Governor General's educational mission to that country. And in one of our many meetings with Brazilian government and university officials, I was struck powerfully by the curious mixture of assurance or confidence and, an, and abjection that defined our Canadian position. By abjection, I mean anxiety, weakness. We were assured and confident in our assumption that we had, we had advantages that our Brazilian colleagues might want, a mature and world-class university system, for example. But we were less confident in our awareness that this advantage is unlikely to continue for much longer, that very shortly the tables will be turned and institutions and countries like our own will depend for their survival on their ability to adapt to a new world order, one in which they are not dominant. Now, about a month earlier, uh, I was present when a similar scene played itself out, but this time in England, where I was attending the British Council's annual conference on global higher education. At the opening event, a member of the British cabinet addressed the approximately 1,400 delegates who had come to London from 120 countries around the world. And oddly oblivious to the reality that he was addressing representatives from the very market that he wished to exploit, he spoke at some length about the need to cultivate and to sell abroad the British brand in higher education. The ironies attending his talk were profound, and I imagine were certainly not lost on the many delegates from Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, the BRICS countries as they've come to be known. Such nations in the so-called developing world, having shaken off political subservience and begun to realize their economic potential, find themselves invited back into a relationship with their previous masters, this time in a new role as customers, customers increasingly vital to the economies of those formerly dominant states. So the two things again, assurance and abjection in our British cabinet minister as in our delegation in Brazil. These are the symptoms of a quiet revolution that is underway across the globe. Realigning power and wealth, problematizing relationships that have seemed settled since the 18th and 19th centuries, challenging the hegemony of received ideas of what one might call normative Europeanness, and making it certain that the new world coming will not be predictable on the basis of the old. Now what fuels my own sense of bliss at this moment is the feeling developed over the last few decades working with students in a number of Canadian universities and particularly strong since my coming to McMaster, that many of you are open, more than open, to an active engagement with the globe, not only as it is right now, but also as it is in the process of becoming. And I know many of you have already sought an active role in addressing economic injustice, suffering, violence, and inhumanity across the world. And we should be very proud of this, of the way in which what one might call a without borders sensibility has taken hold in your generation and given life to formal initiatives aimed at serving the world and its needs in difficult times. I remind you of Dr. Curry's words, pressing you to think of the work you do as service to humanity towards the betterment of human conditions. Now, the most influential model for these more formalized initiatives aimed at bettering uh, the state of, uh, of life worldwide is, of course, Doctors Without Borders, which has a strong McMaster connection, as many of you may know. And Dr. James Obinsky, who was president of Doctors Without Borders when the organization received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1999, was a medical student from this university. And Dr. Obinsky is connected with other Without Borders uh, operations at McMaster, notably Engineers Without Borders. As an institution, we have a long and a distinguished history of high quality engagement with global problems. And in your own faculty, of course, you host the McMaster Institute on Globalization and the Human Condition, 
established in 1998 to study globalizing processes and the way in which these bear upon our lives, on our communities, and our environment. Similarly, in humanities, we have the Center for Peace Studies and a, an honors program and a minor in peace studies. Arching over all of these and many other globally oriented activities at McMaster is our institutional commitment to membership in the United Nations academic impact, which commits us to the practice of higher education and research in support of the global good. Several years ago, we dedicated ourselves through education to the realization of the Millennium Goals of the United Nations. Today, all the talk is of internationalizing higher education, the process which is concluded for you for now, today. This is one of the stated aims of our provincial government, internationalizing higher education, uh, certainly the provincial government, the federal government, and governments as well as educational institutions around the world. In a survey conducted by the International Association of Universities, 87% of institutions worldwide I think the figure is approximately 10,000 institutions worldwide, reported that they include internationalization in their mission statement or their strategic plan. The question is, what do we mean by internationalization? Dependent on where you're situated uh, in the globe, there are varying degrees of consensus on this issue. From what I told you about the Governor General's mission to Brazil, which was preceded several months earlier by a similar mission led by the Prime Minister, um, and a year before that, a similar mission to India and China, it's very clear that the Canadian consensus on this matter is actually quite strong. According to this, our future lies in our international commerce, particularly in the knowledge-based industries of which presumably education is one. But it is interesting to note that there is far less commitment to the idea of internationalization, in higher education at least, in countries of the Middle East, Latin America, and the Caribbean, for example. My stories about Brazil and the British Conference, I hope, provide a clue as to why this is the case. The fact is simply that for countries like our own, and even more so for Britain and European nations, successfully finding new markets for their educational brands is a matter for survival. Now, to conclude some comments on what all this means. I say all of this to indicate that while I could not be more encouraging, supportive, and admiring of your every move to be a force for, go for global change, it is important that you not be so transported by the promise of this moment, by the exhilaration of being strong in love with your global brothers and sisters, that you fail to notice that your own interests may be different from theirs. In the face of so much global suffering, it is tempting to come bearing the gift of answers rather than the more valuable gift of questions. It is tempting to be assured rather than abject in your approach to others. And more problematically even, you can find yourself engaged in remaking the other in your own image, failing to understand unfamiliar cultures, economies, and nations in terms other than a lack of what is valued and celebrated in your own paradigms. To speak only of the internationalizing of higher education, the question is this, what progress does it represent if we fail to do anything but strengthen the normalizing claims of Western rationality as a way of interpreting the world and regulating others? I remember not so long ago when one first began to hear talk of an emerging knowledge economy and today that discourse dominates our understanding of global commerce and culture. And relevant though it is at many levels, one has to wonder about the extent to which our proselytizing of that orthodoxy helps or hinders the growth and prosperity of peoples in developing regions of the world where industrial production on an alternative model remains to some extent critical. One gratifying outcome of the trip to Brazil is confirmation that 12,000 Brazilian students will come to Canadian universities as part of their own government's Science Without Borders program. 
That program is an international education initiative of quite extraordinary magnitude. It will provide scholarships to 100,000 Brazilian students in many, many disciplines to pursue their studies at the best universities around the world. Because of its size, the program will have a major impact, and not just on Brazil itself and on its economic growth, but on universities in all those countries fortunate, fortunate enough to host scholarship students. For us in Canada and here at McMaster, there is the potential for self-renewal and development as our own paradigms and assumptions are challenged by the presence among us of outstanding students from Brazil. And that must be the foundation of our engagement with the future and the globalized condition from which that future is inseparable. Traffic across borders must flow in both directions, as must the benefits of engagement. Without that, a new world community, strong in love, as Wordsworth puts it, will be an illusion, and the expectant bliss of our present moment will go unfulfilled. To all of you, our own social scientists without borders, my warmest best wishes for the lives and the careers you will make in the strange and unfamiliar territory that begins at the doors of this building. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, President Dean, for some very thoughtful, profound comments and questions that all of us in this hall today might well think about. I realize that I'm all that stands between you and some refreshments and celebrations. But I'd like to comment on one aspect of, of this university that that uh, President Dean raised, and that's the McMaster brand. The McMaster brand is a very strong brand in the business of education, one of the best brands in the world, quite frankly. And it's up to all of us, all of you, all of us, that are part of this great university to make sure that that brand remains vibrant and strong, and I'm sure you will be part of the future of how this brand fares in the world at large. I graduated from this university 50 years ago this week, and at that time it was the... <laughs> that time was the 63rd convocation of this university, and the university was 75 years old. Since then, we've had 442 convocations in the last 50 years. And that is a measure of how this university has grown and developed in the last 50 years. It's now one of Canada's leading universities and in the world at large as well. So congratulations to all of you who have now joined the ranks of alumni of this university. My very best wishes on the road ahead for all of you. I have a couple of announcements and then we may adjourn. Immediately following the convocation, a reception will be held for graduates and their guests in the convention center here, Wentworth Rooms, B and C. Flowers that have been delivered for graduates will be available at the coat check in the main lobby. I'd ask you all to please remain standing at your seats until the academic procession and the graduates have left the hall. And I'd ask you now to rise and please join with me in the singing of our national anthem. After the singing of the anthem, this convocation stands adjourned.